Good evening, High Point family. My name is Sasha Vincent Kramer, and I greet you on behalf of our dear pastors, Apostle Thomas H. Vincent and Dr. Curlin Vincent. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. If you're watching via social media, please hit those share buttons and invite someone to watch along with you. We hope you are ready to hear a great word from the Lord on tonight. Let's get our Bibles and our note-taking materials, and let's get right into the Word of God. Good evening, High Point family, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. My name is Elder Deborah White. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge our pastors, our shepherds, Apostle Dr. Thomas Vincent and our co-pastor, Dr. Carolyn Vincent, the shepherds of High Point Christian Tabernacle. Also, I would like to acknowledge my husband, Elder Jimmy White, and the entire High Point family who may be near and far. Background. Let's get a little bit of background. We're going to be talking about the, the Good Shepherd. And our lesson text is going to come from John, the 10th chapter, verses 1 through 11. And also we'll be going to the 23rd Psalm. And shepherding and God dealing with his people as sheep goes back as far as the book of Genesis. In Genesis 49 and 24, or Jacob called the Lord the shepherd, the stone of Israel. And also in Psalms 28 and 9, David invited the Lord to shepherd the people of Israel and to bear them up forever. One thing about being a sheep, you have to know that you need a shepherd because sheep cannot govern themselves like us. We cannot govern. We need the help of the Lord. Oh, yeah, we try and we get by doing it our way, our thing. But we need the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we can be the people and the example of the people in this earth. Isaiah 40 and 11 also mentions a shepherd. But I like this particular scripture because um, it's, it starts off with Isaiah 40 and 1 starts off with comfort ye, comfort ye, what? My people. And then when we go down uh, Isaiah 40 uh, and 11, then when we go down to verse 11, it, he said, I will feed my flock like a shepherd, and he, Jesus, will gather the lambs in his arms. And that's one thing is, is in this relationship, the shepherd does take care of the sheep, but there is an element of intimacy, of communion that God desires to have with his people. And Zechariah 13 and 7 speaks of the Messiah as a shepherd who will be struck and the sheep scattered. And Matthew quotes this the night that Jesus was, was struck, crucified. The Good Shepherd. And John 10, 1 through 11. Uh, let's read that. And just to give you a background of this uh, scripture, uh, previously in chapter 9, Jesus healed a man that had been blind from birth and told, put mud on his eyes and told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam and he was healed. And many witnesses witnessed this. And so this got back to the Pharisees and the Pharisees asked him, who did this? Who healed you? He said, I don't know. All I know that I was blind, but now I see. I don't know his name. But Jesus heard about this. 
uh, about this, uh, the Pharisees inquiring where or who healed you. And so we want to go back to the ninth chapter to put this 10th chapter in perspective. So let's go back to nine, uh, John chapter nine. We want to go back to John chapter 9, and we want to go down to, I believe it's about the 35th verse. John chapter 9, verse 35. Let's try to start there. I think that's a good place to start. Okay. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Jesus heard that this man had been cast out of the synagogue because he was healed by Jesus. And you know, this also, God also does that to us today. If we are in a situation where we are ridiculed, God often will stand up and intervene on our behalf. He will come and comfort us and give us encouraging words. The Holy Spirit will do that for us. And so he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, it is he that talketh, with thee. Remember, Jesus asked him, do you believe on the Son of God? And God reveals himself. He said, it is he that talketh with thee. In verse 38, and he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. You know, let's just know that we can demonstrate our belief in Jesus by worshiping. We know what we worship our Savior, our Deliverer. And Jesus said, For judgment I am coming to this world that they which see not might see. He was the benefit of that. And that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words, words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, if ye were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. Then we go on to the 10th chapter. This conversation is carried over into the 10th chapter where Jesus reveals three things about himself. He said, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, and I laid down my life. In other words, I am the sacrifice. All in one, the door, the shepherd, and the sacrifice. Oh, yes. Jesus is all three. And it just lets us know that a lot of times to, just, to describe how God interacts with his people and what he does for his people, we can't just say one thing. There's so many ways we can we can describe God. We can describe his goodness. We can describe his relationship with us. Yes, he's the Holy Spirit. But yes, also he's my Jehovah Jireh. All those things that God used to describe himself so his people can know him and trust him. So let's go on to John 10 and 1. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. That door is Jesus. So you're going to try to get in to the body of Christ, into Christ some other kind of way. You're the same as a thief and a robber. You don't belong there. You're trespassing. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The shepherd enters in by the door because what? We're going to find out he is the door. To him the porter openeth and the sheep hear his voice and he calleth his own by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. 
Saying to God, it's our responsibility to live as close to God so we may know his voice. Read his word. Guess, guess what? He doesn't change his speech. So if we read his word, we'll know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. And it reminds me in, in Romans, the first chapter, and it just came to my mind how Jesus says the whole, the creation speaks of him. And so man is without an excuse. They... Other people may not know God in detail, but they'll know there is a God. And within their heart, they need to search out and see who is this God of this great universe. So this parable, Jesus spoke to them, but they understood it not. And what things that they were, they understood not what things they were, which he spake unto them them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. And all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. He's talking about the imposters, the false prophets, the Pharisees who wanted to put all these burdens on people, 600 and some rules and regulations in addition to the Ten Commandments. Those are thieves and robbers because what? They're robbing the sheep. And Jesus goes on to say, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. Jesus clearly says salvation is by him. And shall go in and out until fine pasture. They, they will be nourished. They will be fed. The thief, on the other hand, is going to draw a, can a contrast between the shepherd and the sheep. The thief cometh not but for what? To steal and to kill and to destroy. They don't have the well-being of the sheep in mind. Jesus says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Not just life, but abundantly. Abundant life. That's the way God does. He just doesn't meet the need. He exceeds the need. The Bible tells us he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power of what? That works in us. That's, that's a gracious God. That's a good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. That's what the good shepherd does. Gives his life for his sheep. So let's break this down a little bit. Good. It's not in the sense that we use today. You know, because there's some good and there's great and there's better and there's excellent. No, good speaks of moral purity. The good shepherd. He's morally pure. He knows his sheep and calls him by name. And he calls us by name. He knows us. He gets us. He knows what we're made of. Remember, we're formed in the image of God. He has his spirit in us. He communes with us through his word, through prayer. It's his sheep as opposed to those who are not his sheep that enjoy the wonderful fellowship and the pleasures of being in the Lord. So, so you're either a sheep or you're not a sheep. Those who have heard his voice and follow him are his sheep. So there can be several herds um, at night. They may put them all together in, in, in one pen. But in the morning, the shepherd will go forth and he will call his sheep. Not all those sheep will come running, just the sheep that he has a relationship with. The sheep knows their shepherd. So, all of the sheep hear the call, yet only his sheep follow him. 
There is always that frightening possibility when one stubbornly resists the call of Jesus Christ that may be they are not of his sheep, perhaps of his fold. And so he calls them by name. In the book of Luke, as well as in the book of Matthew, it talks about the sheep that has what? Gone astray. And what does the shepherd do? Go back, leave the flock, secures them, leave the flock, and go and get that one and bring them back. Another thing that Jesus does, he leads his sheep, what? To pasture. In other words, he provides provision. He leads us to where we go. We all got those those testimonies of what God just led us to a particular place that we didn't know. We just had a trust us voice. Remember in the book of Hebrews how Abraham went out of his country not knowing where he was going and God led him there. I remember when we first came to Georgia and uh, I was looking for a job. And literally, literally, I put in hundreds of applications. I had it, system system, not getting a job for about seven months. And finally, our husband came, my husband came to join me, us and the children, and um, me and the children. And um, after a while, as looking for a job, I was just folding laundry. And God said, um, go down to the unemployment office. I said, what? Today's Friday. I don't go down there on Friday. It's too crowded. That's when everybody's looking for jobs. At the end of the week. But I went down there and I found a job and it fit me to a T, but it closed that same day. Came home. That was about 35, 40 years ago. Came home, typed it, Got it in because it closed that day. I ended up getting that job and retiring from that job. That was about 20 years, 25 years ago. But when you think about that, how I have been doing all this effort and on one day, and my prayer used to always be, God, I only need one job. I don't need a whole lot. I just need one, just one. And all oh, this big Georgia, you got one job for me. And I did. And that's the only job I've had since I've been working in Georgia, since I've been here in Georgia. I had my own business, but that's the only job I had working for somebody else. When God calls, we have to be in a position that we can respond bond and know his voice. I was doing something. I had an excuse to stay at home and not go downtown. But I recognized that this is probably the voice that I have been waiting for. And so he leads us into a pasture to provide nourishment for us. He seeks the greenest, the best for his people. And we're going to get into that a little bit more when we go to Psalms 23. The shepherd is concerned with the well-being of his flock. He is concerned. Don't be worried about it. He's concerned about you. He has a plan for your life. Don't give up. Don't give in. God is concerned. Jesus said, I am come that they may have life and that more abundantly. He desires that we be taken care of. We don't have nothing to fear. I know it's easier said than done because I've had my fearful moments, but God has delivered and he has showed up just right on time. The hireling, somebody who does not have the sheep's interest, he is more concerned about himself. He's in it only for the money. You know, when we are working for God and doing God's work, we have to be approach it like it's God's, not ours. It's God. It's all about bringing glory to his name, Glory to the kingdom, doing the will of the Father so others can be saved. Uh, 
There are people who treat God's people or ministers, I hate to say that, like hirelings. They can be discerned by their attitude towards the flock. Here's what I mean. The shepherd is saying, how can I feed them? How can I make provision for them? The hireling is saying, how can I fleece them? What can I get out of these people? And we've seen that, but we haven't seen it at high point. We have good leaders. A shepherd watches over the flock for their safety. He does that. He's concerned about us. That's a good shepherd. One thing about sheep, they are defenseless. And the shepherd knows that the sheep can be a victim or fall victim to predators. Uh, they don't run fast, so they can't get away from the predator. So they depend upon the shepherd. And Jesus is the good shepherd. Uh, he helps us to fight. He fights for us. And he teaches how to fight. He's given us spiritual weapons that we can fight and we can war in prayer. He has made provision for us to make it. We don't have to fret. And the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep, which he has already done on Calvary. We must come to realize that how much Jesus has loved us. He loved us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Enough to give his life for us. And his love is beyond comprehension. The love of the shepherd for us. So let's go to... Uh, Psalms 23, and talk about the sheep life. What is life like as a sheep? David wrote this psalm. It is thought that he wrote this psalm while he was king, reflecting on his life. And remember, David was a shepherd. And a shepherd was a menial job that, um, that was usually given to the youngest child uh, to... Uh, to take care of the sheep. And that's the position that David was in. But now he's looking at not how I took care of the sheep, but how did the shepherd take care of me? How well I was taking care of the sheep. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Um, Psalms 23. I shall not want. Uh, that first verse is a statement of proclamation, and that is a statement that I know God is going to make provision. The Lord is my shepherd. It's because he is the shepherd of my soul. I'm not going to want, I'm confident that he's going to meet my needs. I'm making a proclamation that he's my shepherd, and I'm not ashamed to say that. He's, he's king now. He done fought a lot of battles, but he's saying it's God that, his, that is his shepherd. Not only does, is God his shepherd, but what? He knows that God makes provision for him. He's king. He got all the food he wants. He got all the attendance. He got everything he wants, but it's God. God is the shepherd. God is the provider. God is the leader. God is the sustainer of life. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. It's not a forced thing. The pastures are so safe. They're satisfying. I get rest. I'm nourished in it. I want to go there. I want to be led there in his green pastures. Also, he leads me beside the still waters. As I said earlier, the sheep, they are timid animals. If that water is roaring and bubbling. They don't want to drink from it. It has to be quiet. It has to be still. And also going back to the pastures, the, the shepherd goes out and seeks the best land to graze from, to, to feed from, seeks the quiet waters 
for the sheep. They can't find it on their own. They depend upon the shepherd. And that's why in the Old Testament, it says God shepherded his people because they couldn't do it themselves. They didn't know where they were going, but God led them. A lot of times we don't know where we're going, but God led them. When we came here, we quit our jobs. Didn't know where we're going to get, how we was going to be employed. But God led us and provided for us. Provided for us. Uh, another instance, um, my when we were here, my husband was back there for a while because he was waiting for me to get a job. And that's another, we're not going to go into that. But my son liked apple cinnamon oatmeal for breakfast. Had it every morning. Easy to please, yeah? Mother, you just got to get the oatmeal into the house, right? I didn't have any money. I didn't have any oatmeal. Went out to check the mail. In the mailbox was a packet of apple cinnamon oatmeal. That was awesome. When we think about the ramifications of that, how that I, that marketing executive team had an idea, we're going to distribute free packets of oatmeal. And one of them is going to be apple cinnamon oatmeal. The distribution manager got it out on a particular time so that apple cinnamon oatmeal can get in the mail carrier's hand to put it in Mrs. White's mailbox. That's a good shepherd. All of those activities that went into play to get that oatmeal to my residence at that time. That's a good shepherd. And it wasn't even a, a dire need. That's the awesomeness of it. How God intervenes in our lives and makes provision for us. And we don't deserve it. It's just his goodness. Also, it speaks of the shepherd providing strength for us. He restores my soul. Oh. You know, oftentimes we, um, we, we may get down. We may have some low periods. David said, why art thou cast down all oh, my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? You know, David is speaking like a sheep. Here's why. He said, why art thou cast down, O my soul? A sheep becomes cast when they're on their back and they can't get up. Remember, they're short. They've got the short legs and everything. They're not very strong. They, they, they are helpless. They are still. They are dependent upon the shepherd. And David was saying, I feel cast. I can't get up. I feel alone. And the sheep would kick frantically. But the shepherd, because he's a good shepherd, he is watching to make sure none of the sheep are cast. None of the sheep are in trouble. He's watching. The Bible tells us the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong. Hallelujah. God's looking for a miracle. Are you the one? I don't know. But he's ready to show himself strong. So David said, why are you cast down? Oh, my soul, why are you disquieted? Why are you restless? The sheep gets restless. They're social animals. They get restless. Sometimes there's conflict within the flock, and they become restless. And, and, and just like us. And that's why the Bible said, forgive, and it shall be forgiven unto you. How many times shall I forgive my brother? Seven times. No, seven times 70. As much as needed. We 
get restless and God calms them down. And, and um, David said, why are you disquieted? Why are you just nervous? But God restores. That name, that term restores means both restore from sin, like um, David uh, said in Psalms 51, when he was seeking forgiveness, as well, it means restore from or bring back from to health. Restores my soul. My every need is provided by my tender, loving shepherd. Another thing in restoration with with uh, sheep is that he does provide for them by leading them. God has a guide. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness as our guide. Notice it doesn't say path, plural. It says path of righteousness. There are uncertain paths of life, and we have had uncertain paths. It could be whether we have, uh, we don't know what mate God has for us. It could be that we don't know where God wants us to live, what school we should go to. Uh, there are all types of uncertainties that we must go to God and say, what is your will for me in this season? So we don't have the capacity to discern the future and so how important it is that we be led by God because he knows the future. He already knows. Isaiah 40 said, comfort, comfort ye my people. And then Isaiah chapter 40, and it goes on to talk about God's, uh, God's care for his people and his knowledge. And I just think uh, it just brings to light how awesome God's knowledge is and how he is infinite in understanding, infinite in knowledge. So let me see if I can find this real quick. Isaiah chapter, chapter 40, verse 14, it opened right up to that. With whom? Talking about God took he counsel and who instructed him and taught him in path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding? Who did this to God? Nobody. He has this. In verse 13, it says, who hath directed the spirit of the Lord or being his counselor hath taught him? Nobody. But he knows all things. So shouldn't we go to him for our needs, for our direction, for the path that he would have us to take? Yes, because the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He has it. He has the answers. We got to find it out. We have to find it out. He leads us in the path of righteousness. What? For his name's sake. It's to bring glory to God. It ain't just for you. No. That's a secondary reason. But he wants to bring God glory. We should want to bring God some glory. For his name's sake. Also, God has done all these wonderful things. But guess what? Sometimes that path will take us through the valley of the shadow of death. The valley of shadows, got to remember, it is a shadow. Uh, death is a reality, but guess what? Jesus defeated death on the cross. And for a shadow to occur, occur light has to shine on the object. It's just a shadow. What you're going, those things that you're concerned about, it's a shadow. God has you. We don't have to fear the shadow. It's a shadow. God has you. We are to seek God 
for his leadership, for his God. And notice, you walk through it. You're not running. You're walking through it. No hesitation as you're uncertain. No fear, no panic. Why? Because he's with me. He's guiding me. And I don't, I don't know what is going to happen on the other side. But whatever it is, God has me. Another thing, valleys are surrounded by mountains, or it wouldn't be a valley. So what that means is that our mountaintop experience is only mountain is only a few steps away. So the shadow of death, death. Death stands behind the path and casts its shadow over it. Never is his presence more perceptible, knowing the shepherd is the guide. That's so comforting. We walk in this path without fear. He is with me, not just at the end of life, but during life. You know, one thing about the 23rd Psalm, and appropriately so, it is said, and quote it often at funerals. But really, it's something that we need to quote or reflect on every day. Because he is our shepherd. He's our shepherd through the day-to-day -day challenges that we may encounter. We shall not want. We gotta, we got to, we have to proclaim that. I was going through a little uh trial last week, week before last, and I was thinking about this subject. I said, But the Lord is my shepherd. I was doing what I needed to do to address the issue, but I kept telling him, God got this. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where this is taking me, but the Lord is my shepherd. That's what I just kept saying. The Lord is my shepherd. And everything turned out. You, you're getting a pink slip. The Lord is my shepherd. You need to look for a home. The Lord is my shepherd. He'll lead you. You want to decide on what school to go to? The Lord is my shepherd. Which doctor should I go to? The Lord is my shepherd. Should I take that prescription? The Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> yes, he is. I'm looking to him for his guidance. So, whatever we do, it's for his name's sake. We want to bring glory to God. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Whatever we do in word or do, deed, we need to do it in the name of Jesus. Goes on to say, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. They bring comfort, thy rod and thy staff. What do you mean by a rod and a staff? <laughs> How does it comfort you? Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a good thing. Uh, but when we look at the role of the shepherd and his tools, his rod and his staff that he had to defend the sheep, Remember in 1 Samuel chapter 17, how David was uh, went to Saul, or he was brought to Saul because he volunteered to fight Goliath? And he tells him, the Lord, he, did, he delivered him out of the paw of a lion and out of the bear, and he would deliver him out of from this Philistine. And he said that because a lion and a bear came in and took its flock. But what did he take? Took that rod, which was a short root type thing that they would keep in their belt. That's what I'm told. And there's some dispute uh, whether it was that description, but for the purposes here. And um, he bit, he slew him. He, he went after him after a bear and a lion, and because of past deliverances, past deliverances, God can deliver you out of whatever your situation is. He deduced, he delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. 
Therefore, just like a mathematical equation, he will deliver me from this Philistine. He's going to deliver me. And so those are the words, and that's the confidence, and that's the strength that we get, what? From the rod and his staff. The word of God lets us know those same victories in principle are entitled to me today. And I'm going to walk in them. Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4 and 12, also a rod was used as something to discipline, and it represents power and authority. And he said, what will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? He said, choose. Do you want discipline? Do you want rebuke? Or do you want love in the spirit of meekness? Paul didn't want to go there, but he had to let them know that they were wrong, that they were wrong. The staff also was used to discipline, and it directs or aid or to guide the sheep where they were going. And that's what the Word of God does. It guides us in, into our, during our life journey. It provides wisdom. It provides knowledge. You, know, you, you go and look at the Word, and you get more understanding. And you apply that understanding to your, to your challenges in life. So let us move along quickly. God as a host. Why? Because he prepares a table. <laughs> we just come, we were just in the valley of the shadow of death. The rod and his staff, they comfort me. But guess what? He's preparing a table before me. Where? In the presence of my enemies. What? What? Guess what? Don't let us know that even though we get go through troubles and we get trials, guess what? We have fellowship with him. We don't have to be fearful. In the presence of my enemy, I'm going to sit at my Lord's table. I'm going to eat. I'm going to drink. I'm going to fellowship with him. Yes, all this stuff is going on, but God is going to give me wisdom because what? The rod and the staff is guiding me. Oh, yes. And at the same time, I can fellowship with my Lord, my Savior, my Creator, my Redeemer, my soon coming King. Yes, I can. God prepares you for his table. Not only does he prepare the table, but he prepares you for his table. Going through that valley, green pastures, still waters, the rod, and that's preparing you for his table, both here and eternity. God gives us sustenance. He sustains us, even in the face of the, my enemies. And when I'm doing that, they can't touch me because God got me. He got me. He anoints my head with oil. This is so necessary for our health, that the anointing, our spiritual health. They would anoint the sheep's head with oil in the event they get caught into something they can get loose. Remember, they're helpless, helpless. We need the anointing to help us get through life. Another thing, oftentimes they would get um, parasites or bugs on them and bugs up in your nose that would lay eggs and it would, it would drive them buggy, buggy. And they would hit some instances, their head on the ground constantly, constantly. And left to themselves, they will kill themselves because of a bug, a bug. Get buggy. We ought not to get buggy. The shepherd needs to apply that anointing, the Holy Spirit, that what leads us and guides us to all truth, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, that brings us comfort. That's what we got. We got the oil of anointing. And says the yoke is destroyed because of the anointing. That trouble, that thing is buggy because of the anointing. So he anoints his head with oil. And that was a practice that oil, as you know, was 
for kings or installations. Oil is smeared on the person, placed on them to show that the presence of God is with them. Also, there's an oil of gladness that God gives us that get, makes us glad. If we would just receive it, if we would just apply it, if we would just read of it, if we just welcome it, the oil of gladness. My cup runneth over. Uh, God specializes in overrun. You know, my cup runneth over. And not only does it run over for my benefit, but it runs over so I can share with other people. And even, it's just that my cup is running over. And God makes provision for, uh, for that I may have so I can share with other people. He makes provision so I can, what, help take care of my family and support my husband in taking care of his family. My cup runneth over, and God specializes in overruns. 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 And it runneth over, and we drink tea drinkers, coffee drinkers. Uh, we've gotten away from always using a saucer. But um, that stuff in the saucer can help feed other people, can help other people. So we want to be a blessing to other people. Abundance in everything I need. God just don't give you just enough. But a lot of times he gives us more than enough. That's the kind of God he is. It's, this psalm concludes with goodness and mercy. We have the God leading us through the valley of the shadow of death. Also, it says, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Goodness and mercy, those two twins, will follow me. And I often say, I like to view goodness and mercy as a reversible jacket. Goodness on one side, mercy on the other. They're together, inseparable. Because whenever you see, I'll put myself, me doing something good, I believe I've been at the seat of mercy. I've been at the mercy seat because I need mercy. I'm a recipient of his mercy. So anything that we do good, we can't boast in it because we are recipients of God's mercy, his undeserving greatness, goodness towards us. So goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And if goodness and mercy is following me, Guess what? Wherever I go, I should be leaving a trail of goodness and mercy because God has been good to me. Now, also, should follow me all the days of my life and as a result, and I am confident I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is a declaration. This is a not just an aspiration, but a declaration. I can say for certainty, I'm going to dwell in his house. Oh, forever, forever, I will be protected. Oh, yes, in John 14, 2 and 3, it says, In my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, Jesus is speaking, I would, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's just that God always preparing stuff. He prepares me a table in the presence of my enemies. God has gone to prepare a place for me. That's just like him, always thinking about us. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come. I'm coming back 
again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. God wants to be in our presence. In his presence, there is fullness of joy and his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And I want to conclude and close out with this scripture. In Hebrews 13, 20 and 21, it's actually a blessing, a scripture of blessing. The God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work. Everybody under the sound of my voice, I pray that you be made perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever and ever. Amen and amen and amen. God bless you, High Point. We love you and you be blessed. The Lord is your shepherd. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that great word from the Lord on tonight. We hope that you all enjoyed Bible study on this evening. Now we are asking that you get ready to give. If you're giving online, you can visit our website, www.highpointlive.org. Scroll down to the bottom of the page and click the donation tab. If you're giving by mail, you can send your tithes and your offerings to High Point Christian Tabernacle, P.O. Box 813-699, Smyrna, Georgia 30081. These are your upcoming events and announcements. All parents, please listen attentively as we announce the ARC Summer Schedule. The ARC will be hosting Donuts for Dads in the Fellowship Hall. This is taking place on Father's Day, which is Sunday, June 18th, from 10 a.m. to 10.45 a.m. On June 25th, the ARC will not be in session, and the month of July, the ARC will be closed for summer break and will resume August 2023. High Point family, are you ready for Vacation Bible School 2023? The theme this year is GLOW, Shine Bright for Jesus. This is taking place June 21st through the 23rd. The time nightly will be 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Dinner will be served for the children from 6.15 to 7 p.m. nightly. There will be classes offered for every age group. And on Saturday, get ready for our annual block party. This is taking place on June 24th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. There will be food, games, bounce houses, game trucks, petting zoo, photo booth, painting party, ice cream trucks, and much more. You don't want to miss this great community event. The month of June is Men's Health Month. And the week leading up to Father's Day is celebrated as Men's Health Week. Join our healthcare professional department on June 18th as we promote awareness of preventable health problems and encourage early detection and treatment of disease among men and boys. Please stop by our information table before and after service to obtain valuable information related to men's health. High Point family, our nation has now declared that the COVID pandemic is past. Though the virus still exists, we are no longer in the pandemic stage. We are no longer required to wear masks. Accordingly, Pastor is now lifting the mask mandate for High Point Christian Tabernacle. The wearing of masks will now be optional. High Point Gang, we want you to save the date. Our Youth Summer Shake-Up Part 2 is coming up in July. The dates are July 7th through the 9th. We will have activities for our youth and young adults each day. In preparation for our Summer Shake-Up services, 
we will be having youth, young adult, and children's choir rehearsal on Sunday, June 11th and Sunday, June 25th, immediately following morning worship. The rehearsals will be brief. All parents, please mark your calendars and save these dates. We also want to invite you out to our Sunday services at 11 a.m. And I tell you, you don't want to miss a service. God has been having his way at High Point every Sunday. Amen. Remember all of those who are on the prayer list as well. Thank you so much for joining us on tonight, High Point. We love you and we look forward to seeing you on Sunday. God bless you.